My guest tonight is the president of Eurasia Group and G Zero Media, and author of the New York Times bestselling book Us Versus Them: The Failure of Globalism. Please welcome Ian Bremmer. <laughs> Welcome to the show. Thanks. As uh, someone who spends all of his time in geopolitics and studying the world, uh, before we get to the book, let's spend a moment talking about this manic week that we've had. Uh, the most recent news, obviously, Trump and uh, Kim Jong-un speaking for the first time, a historic meeting between yes. uh, the leaders of the two nations. Interestingly enough, the White House sent out a blast today saying this was a great achievement, everything went well, and they used a piece of your writing to, to, to confirm that. Do you think that this went well for President Trump? It's the first time they've done that. I assume it's connected to me being on your show tonight. Um, I, uh... <laughs> just start with that. Uh, yeah, it did go well. Look, I mean, it, it, the fact is that for 20, 30 years, the North Koreans have been developing missile capabilities, developing cyber capabilities, right. developing their nukes. We haven't done a damn thing. We've tried. We've not gotten there. We now have a test suspension from the North Koreans that was unilateral. Right. And we have them engaging diplomatically, not just with the Americans, but perhaps more importantly, with the Chinese, the South Koreans, the Russians, all the countries in the region. And, and the likelihood of actually blowing up the Korean Peninsula right now is as low as it's been in a long time. That's, right. that's a good thing. Well, now, a lot of people's criticism didn't come from the fact that the meeting was, was a good thing or not yeah. a good thing. I mean, like I always said from the beginning, I wanted Trump to speak to Kim. I was like, make something happen. Yeah. But what I found strange was the fact that he came back and he said, it's all over, everything is good now, mission accomplished, mission basically. Accomplished, basically. It's, it's, yeah. it's all done. Yeah. But really, there were no concrete measures. Isn't that a problem? Be seeing as North Korea has made a deal with the West before and then reneged on that. Look, the concrete measures are that the North Koreans are now actually engaging. The only leader the North Korean had met with before Fire and Fury right. was Dennis Rodman. Right? <laughs> like, that was it. Right. So, I mean, the fact that we now actually have them engaging is clearly objectively a good thing. Right. And they're gonna have to give something. I mean, I've seen in the media in the last 24 hours a lot of Trump critics saying that we gave them everything they wanted. Right. Well, we haven't taken any sanctions off. We're not recognizing them as a nuclear power. Uh, we're not sending an embassy over. We have suspended um, our military exercises, which, by the way, that freeze for freeze, they freeze their tests. Right. We freeze our exercises. That's what the Chinese have been suggesting for years, which, frankly, was not such a nonsensible idea. Uh -huh. So I would say we're confidence-building measures. The problem is that Trump doesn't prep. So as a consequence, he doesn't tell the South Koreans and the Japanese in advance, I'm going to give away these joint exercises. Right. So when they hear it come out, they're stunned. Just like Rex Tillerson was stunned when he said, we're going to meet. And then the South Koreans and the Japanese were stunned when he said, actually, we're not going to meet. Right. right? Like it was, you need someone in the White House that just calls people and says, he's going to do this, right? <laughs> but you can't have someone who calls people if even he doesn't know he's going to do it, because he's, <laughs> he's flying by the seat, man. So, okay, so yeah. North Korea, in your opinion, went well. He didn't give away everything. On the G7 side, a very different story. You do not think the G7 went well? No, it was a disaster. In right? what way? In every way. Okay, that's, that's, that's specific, I get it. Well, let's uh, think about the allies, the G7 allies. Right. Think about what they're upset about. Before the G7, from Trump leaving the Trans-Pacific Partnership to Trump leaving Paris Climate Accord mm -hmm. to Trump putting embassy in Jerusalem to Trump leaving the Iranian deal, then he shows up late. He cancels his meeting by big bilateral with Macron, the French president. Right. He leaves early, and then he sends a Twitter barrage against the Canadian prime minister. Right which is not the first person you'd kind of expect to be taking that right, on, right, right? right. I mean, and, and that's the public stuff. The private stuff that he was saying in that meeting that I've heard about, it, like, saying, why do we even support NATO? Like, why, why would we defend Germany? Literally saying this to other heads of state at this meeting, saying, why would we support Ukraine at all? They're all corrupt. It, it, and, and the other leaders there are being polite because he does run the world's only superpower. Right. But they're mortified. With that type of thinking, then, do you think Americans and the world should grapple with the notion and the idea that there is a possibility that America may, over time, come to see itself as an ally of countries like Russia and maybe China as opposed to Canada and Germany? No. You don't think that'll happen? No. You want to know why? Why? Okay. I'm just, this is like, I'm just like leading. A, I'm leading the like, witness. This is like a magic trick. Yeah, I like yeah, yeah. it. I like, okay, it's like a magic trick. 
<laughs> so, um, no, the reason why is because even though Trump is oriented towards getting along with the strong man, this country is not, unlike Russia, run by one man. Right. And so he's enormously frustrated that he's not able to actually work closely with the Russians. We put more sanctions on Russia just two days ago. Right? I mean, he can't engage with the Chinese strongly because everyone in the United States government, including Mattis, the Secretary of Defense, right, who's right, quite right. competent, is saying, these guys are ripping us off blind, and they're our principal strategic antagonist in the region. So, you know, the problem is not that Trump is about to create an alliance with Russia. The problem is that the United States is going to be left in a much weaker global position, while the one big country in the world that's really doing strategy, it ain't the Germans, it ain't the French, it's China. Like, it's one thing for them to rip us off in IP. Mm -hmm. It's another thing when the Chinese steal our strategy, right. which is spend a lot of money globally and get countries to be aligned with you. That's how we became great. Right. And now the Chinese are doing that. And that's not okay. Another Chinese knockoff. I get it. Yeah. I get it. <laughs> let's, talk about, let's talk about the book, Us Versus Them, The Failure of Globalism. Do you truly believe globalism has failed? I do. I why, do. Do you, why do you say that? Sir? Let's be clear. I don't believe globalization has failed, uh -huh. right? I mean, we've gotten a half of the world's people in extreme poverty out of poverty just in the last 20 years, right? right? Immunization, like 90% of the world's population, that's globalization. But globalism is an ideology that's been put forward by the West and the advanced industrial democracies that says if we have open borders and free trade, right. and if the United States and our allies defend people all over the world, that's gonna be awesome. And you know what? That's been awesome for me. It's been awesome for elites living in the West, mm -hmm. but as should be very apparent, and not just in the United States, an increasingly large percentage of our populations feel like that is just a lie. Right. It's not worked for them. They, they feel like they're being left behind, so they go, the problem with globalism is it benefits the elites. You get big corporations that make a lot of money. Open trade benefits them because they get to rake in all of the profits. Is that why then populism becomes the natural counterbalance in the situation? We see it happening in Italy. You see it happening in the United States where a message of us versus them becomes more popular than the message of we're all in this together. Trevor, I wish it was just about economics. It's worse than that, right? I mean, you look in Germany, and actually the working class feels good about the trajectory of their economy, but they can't stand the fact that they've allowed in all of these migrants from Syria and from North Africa and the Middle right. East. And so for them, it's much more cultural. It's a security issue. They're taking benefits away from me that these people aren't real Germans, and they're threatening and they're gonna hurt our women, right. and they're gonna call... What did Trump say about the Mexicans coming over to rape, right? He said they're, they're, gun, they're, they're bringing yeah. drugs and they're bringing crime and they're bringing... Same thing, right? Do, do I win? Do yes, I win? you win. Oh, right. Italy, same thing. South Africa, right. this is happening too, right? I mean, you've got a lot of people in South Africa saying that Mandela, Nelson Mandela, was actually in basically in cahoots with the white man, and we right. need to take back our power. If the only advanced industrial democracy, this is not happening, is Japan because population is shrinking, so per capita, they feel pretty good. Right. No immigration, so they're all Japanese. And the military is prevented constitutionally from fighting in wars outside the country. So the U.S. fights in Afghanistan. The enlisted men and women voted for Trump. They did not vote for Hillary. Why? Because they couldn't stand the idea of all of these forever wars that they thought at least Trump would want to get out. And when you hear Trump saying now 32,000 troops in South Korea, right. why do we have them there? I didn't see anyone else saying that. So you have an interesting uh, position on this, and, and it, it puts us in a predicament. If populism seems to be saying the right-ish things, yeah. uh, excuse the pun, and then globalism is saying something that doesn't seem to be panning out, how do we then begin to correct this in a realistic way? Where, where do we even start? Well, you can't presume that um, allowing globalization to happen without taking any responsibility for those that feel like they were left behind is gonna work for these people. But, but if they feel like they're left behind, like you said, so if it's not economical, if they feel like they're left behind, but they weren't actually left behind, then how do you solve that situation? Well, because, some of it is economic, but right. some, of it, some of it is Afghanistan and Iraq and Syria right, and the Americans right. get involved in failed wars. Some of it is that we don't actually need the same amount of foreign labor that we had, you know, sort of 50 years ago. I mean, especially you look at the technology revolution and you see that automation and AI means you don't need as many people, so maybe right. we do need to rationalize immigration. Could, could, it, could it also be that there are many people who have harbored racism for a long time but just needed somebody to trigger it? Because it feels like there were many people who became racist instantly with Trump. But when you look at it, it, it stands to reason there, there are some who were racist 
or harbored racist tendencies and ideas, but they didn't feel like they had the platform or the right to be racist. And you hear many people saying, it's Trump country now. Oh, yeah. I can do whatever I want. So could that be the underlying thing, is that it never went away, it's just people felt like it was less and less acceptable, and now it's just given rise to that. He's clearly made it acceptable for all sorts of Americans to say, that's right, someone is finally paying attention to the right. white underclass people have been ignoring for a while. We had a black president. No one cared about us. Now we are. And we can say these shithole countries, sub-Saharan Africa, right. and, you know, sort of how dare these black athletes. We let them make millions of dollars, and they kneel for our national anthem. I mean, that's... We know what that is. Right. But it's not... The fact that this is happening in so many other countries around the world where there's no Trump, the fact that the Brits voted for Brexit. Right, the right. The fact right. that in Italy you actually have by far the most anti-establishment vote that you've seen since World War II. I mean, this has happened even in Canada, where it's not overtly racist. We saw Doug Ford take, by a landslide, the second most powerful position in Canada. He's the Premier of Ontario now, just last week. But that's a scary thought, then, because then what you're saying is there's almost like a virus going around the world that's secretly spreading, maybe online or maybe in some other way, and we, we don't know where it's coming from or... How to stop it? Is that what you're saying? We know that we need to address the social contract in a much more fundamental way. Right. We have to pay attention to these people. We have to do infrastructure... Infrastructure week, right? Who's talking about that? Well, Trump tried many times, but then porn star things happened. Went nowhere, <laughs> right? Right. I mean, we, we have to focus on those things. Uh, you know, education. And the fact that the national government is likely not to be most of the solution means that at state level, at city level, uh, philanthropists, Entrepreneurs, I mean, that's it's for me. This feels like climate change 40 years ago, right? Right, where we knew if you were a scientist that focused on climatology, you knew it was coming, right. but no right. governments were paying attention, right? So, you had to get folks to start dealing with it, doing experiments locally. Now, today, the governments are still behind, but solar power today is cheaper than coal during the day, and that's because over time, human beings collectively said, We've got a big problem, right. and when things get hard, we can be better. And, and that's absolutely the only way we fix this problem, is that things are going to get hard, and we have to be better. It's a fascinating book. You're a fascinating man. Thank you so much Thank for being you, on Trevor. the show. Really appreciate it. Us versus them is available now in Bremer, everybody.